Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fathoms Deep, a Black Sales podcast from Common Room Radio. I'm Elizabeth Stevens. I'm Daphne Olive, and we have the pleasure of having Luke Arnold with us again. Hey, Luke. Everyone, good to be back. It is so much fun to have you back, and I think we need to start by saying, holy shit, dude, season four was amazing, and you were amazing. Yeah, really gorgeous work. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was of uh, hit that landing is uh was really scary coming up to it whether whether it was gonna all make sense yeah and, and not only like it, it happened in the, whether the last season helps the season before whether the last episode uh, and then it's scary when you get up to the point going where there's a scene like you know the with toby in the woods and all that like yeah. walking on the onto set in the morning going oh if we don't make this work i think the whole show's for nothing like it feels damn yeah no when you put it that way it's true at the moment yeah and so yeah it was very different to any time before and it's even changing the way talking about the show it's like when we came on and talked before it's it's still this living breathing thing that's happening and moving mm-hmm. and kind of between seasons you wouldn't get too precious about the work or like if it was good or not and so now we're reaching this point where it's all done right. and dust and it, it it feels different it feels different to talk about um but I'm very happy that it ended as well as it did. I'm really proud of the work everyone did. And I think it's an, a major feat to finish a show like, uh, like Black Sales did. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's interesting. So the last time we spoke, you had filmed it all, but you hadn't seen the finished product, at least at the right? last two episodes, wow. right? Maybe yeah, you had I, seen some I of them? I think that's where we were. So it was still alive and, all, and no one else had seen it yet. So it still felt alive. But from what I recall, yes, yeah, right. it was all done and dusted. My work on it was done. But, you know, you still have press to do. You're still going to see everyone. It's still this thing out there. Um, yeah. yeah. And it's funny. It was like, it was very weird the night the last episode aired. I was going like, to say, oh, can okay. you tell us about that? Because I definitely want to hear your perspective on oh, it. I was, that was wasted. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, that's I, the only way to do it. God, I love you, Luke. Uh-huh. <laughs> no, it was also, so, so what was happening, I was filming, uh, doing a film down in Santa Fe and we were actually shooting mm. Tuesday to Sunday schedule. So there was no way I was going to make it back. And I was on almost yeah. every day while I was down there. Um, and then it just turned out that I could get off early with enough time to fly back. Yeah. So it was kind of a rush thing that I got back there. And I kind of checked it in my hotel. I don't think I'd eaten anything. And then I was like, uh, oh my goodness. For some reason, the hotel I was in had half price on the minibar for some mad reason. And then, um, Good Schmitz, night. I was, I was thinking that was an event going on where we were all going to come and watch and tweet together. And then I uh-huh. said to Schmitz, going, hey, I'm staying in the hotel where the event is. So if you want to come around early, and he's like, I'll be there in 15 minutes. So I don't know what time of the afternoon that was. But then we did an yeah. event. We like, live tweeted it for the. Uh, east coast then for the west coast so by the time we got to the end of the <gasps> oh, night oh jeez at sober middle of the night it, it was all pretty uh pretty hazy absolutely yeah i think was it our first live tweet of black sail daphne where we had just done the interview with craig and lisa and we're just drunk yes, we were also we were also <laughs> We were also trashed because we had drink. just spent three. We we were basically the same. We had spent three hours drinking yeah, with Craig sure. and Lisa. Oh yeah, remotely, <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> no regrets. So we came we came into that live tweet. Also, just I was blitzed. like, oh shit, yeah. I need to actually pay attention to what people are tweeting now. <laughs> and I had the prank because I. It was a good I, I day. thought I was going to be alone in a hotel room in Santa Fe. No, I thought I was going to be on set in Santa Fe. I was going to say, I totally so I could have come and uh... bought you a drink in Santa Fe, so I'm going to not be mad about that. It's fine. We're good. Think about that. But, yeah, so instead it's I was, good. yeah, up there. And, um, yeah, so it's I made really it back, fun. but it was a while. And, it, it you know, it's, it's, it's strange to say goodbye to the show that way. Like, it's exciting, but it's also, yeah. you know, it's, that's the end of it, really. Yeah. But once again, I've seen, you know, we were all at that night. We all keep in touch. And as far as the cast yeah. and crew goes, we'll see each other a lot. But that story is, it's all done now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I wanted to start our official questions. Um, that's an adorable story. <laughs> and we love it. I have a question from, maybe from interviews, you said this, other interviews, you said this as well. But from our last interview, you said something that I kept thinking about all during season four was that you said that essentially you were playing, you know, that Silver we had talked about Silver's arc and his transformations, but you said that in season four, you felt like you kind of played three different people, like that the other seasons you played a different person each season. And then in season four, you played 
three separate people in the in the span of that season. So I was curious how you delineated those four those three people. Yeah, Sorry. and I think that's more once again, I've always been the same person. It's almost in archetype sense. Or we if you were if there were it's almost like he'd be a different kind of lead in three different movies. And mm-hmm. the beginning being the kind of young like still feeling like a young man. Like and the kind of the young the young mm-hmm. warrior that you kind of that is kind of an archetype. Yes. He's got the romance, he's going off to fight for his lady and the cause, mm-hmm. and he has his friends and we're all banding together, you know, which is a yeah, so I think at the beginning he's that. Then that all gets dashed and torn apart. And even when he's off on his own, he's still fighting for that though. He's still that young, you know, he's the the face of the revolution and yeah. he's still feeling that until he gets back. So he gets back into town and you've got Bill Ides. And for a couple of episodes there, it's almost more like the Tony Soprano role. Is that oh. he's not out trying to do anything. Everyone's coming to him. So he spent three episodes where he's mm-hmm. trying to get, you know, he's forcing things through and he's trying to make things happen. And then a few episodes where he's the king and he's managing mm-hmm. everyone else and working out who to do, like what to do and who to whack and what happens next. Mm-hmm. And he's got the world on his shoulders and, Literally on the throne, which is pretty great. That, yeah, chair. exactly. That and it's and there's there wasn't much real jump between that. It's like he comes back and it's like you've got to fill this role now. It's like okay, here mm-hmm. we go. And it's interesting that kind of there's the scenes with Marty there, but she's also away for parts of that. And then that leads to the point that that he's the king, but he's getting everyone together, and we're going to war. And it's you know once again that the image of him on a throne is very different to him washed up on the beach, covered in sand at the beginning. Sure. And then when Marty's gone, it switches again. So that's the moment we go into the third phase, which, and there's almost, you know, which is kind of two, because that, once again, what's driving him shifts. But it's a bit more of Romeo in the later stages. It's kind of younger again. It's like, yeah, he, sure. He goes from this, this, in the middle of the season, he's, he seems to have aged quite a lot. And he's, he's, yes. Yeah, he's becoming the king, and then back then he's an angry young man who is who's back with all his heart and his passions, and the cause starts to fade into the background. Hmm. So yeah, so that was it. that was kind of the splits for me, like the kind of defining points of where it was like, okay, I think I don't have to worry about consistency here, rather than just be in the moment of what this character is dealing with and who they have to be mm-hmm. in that. You know, in that episode. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, it's it's interesting that we're talking now. Like, I feel like both of us, Liz, am I speaking for both of us and saying that we, since watching the season finale and podcasting about it, we both have gone through some serious evolution in our feelings about Silver. Yeah, well, I think you have to. It's, it's, sure. It's, yeah, no, but it was interesting because it was like, I was actually listening to some of our episode podcasts about, about season four and like, we felt so much for Silver, like, because Silver d- did seem to be so struggling throughout, not just when Madi, when he thought Madi was dead, but even before that, it seemed like Silver was just like, okay, I've got this crown, but now Flint left me, and I don't really know what to do with myself, and my girlfriend's, like, really focused on this other thing, and... Well, it was that moment when Silver had asked if he would be enough. I think that's yeah. when we were yeah. so invested in him personally, rather than, you know, as Long John, and, and as the leader of this cause. Well, I think that was, that, right. that's where it always fell for me. Is I, And I think it was interesting last time we talked about, I think, how Toby Schmitz and I, when we first came into the show, you know, weren't worried about making the characters cool. And as it continued, it's still that thing of, for Silver, he, he, he is the man from nowhere. In a way, he can at points mm-hmm. be the everyman and the one that, Maybe not the one we want to be, but maybe the one we probably would be. I think Rackham's often the same in some areas. Where mm-hmm. to maybe to jump ahead a little bit to that discussion in the because I thought I didn't know if everyone was going to hate Silver at the end, and it's interesting. I think you were talking in the big round table. Oh, no, no, t- sorry, you're talking with the John in the John podcast about how Max stopped the show, and mm-hmm. and so does as do everyone involved in that plan, and also Silver stopped the show in a lot of ways. And I don't know how you're ever going to yeah. enjoy a character saying this is over now yeah the fun is right (laughs) i'm taking my ball and going home (laughs) that is kind of what he said exactly and and but that's and that is where he started as well that when he came at the beginning one of the interesting things the evolution of silver from season one to two i know something john said is they kind of realized they'd written a character who was trying to leave the show 
you know, yeah. he didn't want to be there. And, that, and so you had to find a reason to bring him in. Mm -hmm. So once again, it's where there's all temptations as an actor, you know, to be complete, someone who completely takes on the mantle in bodies. And you're rooting for someone to do that. You want them to become this thing. But if he had just become Flint, there's, I don't know what that story would have been at the end or what that would have meant if it had actually just been two Flint standing next to each other at the end going, sure, hey, we yeah. all want the same things mm -hmm. now. There's a bit of, in that scene at the end of Flint and Silver in the Woods and the dragon speech, is kind of what it came down to for me is that I think in that moment, Flint is the guy we wish we could be. Yes. But Silver's probably who we are. Exactly. In exactly. most decisions mm. in, our, in our life. And I think that's it, that we're faced with that kind of decision so many times in our lives is are we going to keep fighting the good fight against whether, you know, routine and society and right. laws and rules and all these things that oppress us but give us comfort and also, you know, stop you having to go to war or do you, in the many types of way you can, go to war, whether it's actually physically or just by every day being someone who is pushing other people in the face, <laughs> you know, going like, no, look at this, think about this, break out of this. And we all want to be that person. I mean, that's right. the image of every rock star and of, of all the great artists and revolutionaries and everyone, it's all that. But at some point, we, most people stop doing right. that. Right. You either die or you turn, you know. And it's interesting that, yeah, Flint reaches the point where he's most that. He most is ready and to really realize himself as an anarchist, but the visionary um, who has, you know, who does believe that you could push humanity across that line and we'll, if we burn it down, something better will rise from the ashes. And, Silver is the realist going, I don't think so. Right. And also for me right now, as he said, I don't care. I think right. yeah. it's burning everything down. Yeah. Because what we'd have to burn down is too important to me now. So that's kind of where it always felt like for me. And, and it felt an easy thing to play then. Right. And to connect. To. No, you did it perfectly. I mean, I think for me personally, part of my initial reaction, I mean, again, you know, all of us want the great ideal. And, you know, I think the dragon speech might be possibly the best revolutionary speech God, I've ever so seen in a story. It's so so it's really hard yeah. to be like sympathetic to the guy who's like, yeah, I don't actually, you know, that whole thing you just said, like, I don't really give a shit. So <laughs> it's hard mm -hmm. to root for that guy. Yeah. But I think it's true. It is because it is exactly that we all, you know, me, my response to silver was because I want to be the person who is always in favor of the amazing revolution but, you know, I have a house and I have a family and I have a kid and I'm not going to actually go do that thing. Yeah. yeah. And that's, and I, I think there was even a personal, it, it, there's a, a moment for Silver, I think, that is one of the, why he has to kind of go to this point is I think after episode nine, when they're like, Silver's gone complete, you know, they turned on each other. They're fighting. Silver's trying to kill him. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. he really is at points there. It's so sad. And, then when they're when he's like, the moment Flint, you know, they're back on the ship with Racky, you know, Racky leaves mm -hmm. the room and stuff. We're gonna put it. I understand it. We're gonna put it back together. I think he's while he may not see everything Flint is. I think what he sees there is so clearly that it's like mm. you won't. St he's that stubborn mm -hmm. that after this and everything we've gone, he can't dislodge this thing from his mind. He put this plan together, yeah. and now I'm part of this plan. And even he can't even dislodge me from the plan now because it has to be this thing. <laughs> Bec and because think... because Silver and Maddie were, you know, two halves of, you know, what did he say? That they're the world in balance. So, like, yeah. he had, he had yeah. moved the thing to That's them. That's right. And I think even seeing him there is, it's. I think there's a moment of heartbreak for Silver at that moment of going, it's not going like, oh, you're forgiving me of this. It's just like. Oh, you can't stop chasing your own tail on this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nothing is like that. What could be more? What could be more of a message that this is broken than everything that just happened? <laughs> but you trying to tell me to my face something that I know isn't in me anymore? You know, I'm saying this is broken. You're telling me no, we will do this and this. Mm -hmm. I think that was one of the shifts too of just going like, oh, with still the love for him, kind of going, I, I. Don't think you're going to, you're not going to walk away on your own. Yeah. And I know what happens to you and everyone around you if you keep going down this path. Yeah. So it's, uh, I, I think that's it. Over that, those last few episodes of season four, there's just a, 
a grim reality, at least in Silver's mind, falling around him, where I think where the ideal is falling away and a very brutal reality is starting yeah. to creep in. The thing, the thing that so moves me about watching that whole process is that, um, you know, the writing and also your and Toby's performances really expressed I mean, I think John, John expressed this beautifully about how you all basically weren't seeing each other. I think my question was whether Silver wasn't seeing Flint. And he was like, well, they're both basically like just coming from some such different perspectives that they're not seeing each yeah. other. But the amazing yeah. thing is that somehow through all of that conflict, um, you both managed to express also the very deep love that there was between the two characters and that's what makes it tragic that's that's where the beautiful tragedy comes from it is that there's conflict and there's caring at the same time yeah i think when he goes in and he pulls that gun yeah whichever whichever ending you decide it goes with you decide to go with it's still he's stopping flint for his own good in in silver's head right and the closest thing i could relate it to was kind of putting down the family dog oh that like mm-hmm. on a farm like because in silver's head he got he's just gone he's an agent of chaos yeah that will not stop himself mm-hmm. right. so i'm trying to say like i there is a life for you that i like there is a way to walk away from this that will be better for you but i think in the like with the family dog if it's you know on a farm it it gets blooded it you know it bites a sheep or whatever and you go we cut for it's it's something else now and you love it but it's turned into this thing mm-hmm. and you have to go sorry i have i love you this but we, it's time to it's wow. i have to stop this right. for your own good and that was kind of my feelings with that like what why the kind of thing i drew upon for that mm-hmm. because it as much as also you just got toby stevens there delivering that performance Holy shit. So i don't know how quiet. you stand across from that <laughs> I mean, you're, you are amazing. Yeah. His is pot, like, I, I'm, no. I, I'm like, t- go in terrified every time I watch it because I just lose it every <laughs> single time. <laughs> it's it's, a no, beautiful it's amazing. But yeah, but I think for Silver's Head, that was the kind of mm-hmm. mentality of going yeah. like, you are, this path you're on is only destruction for you and everyone around you. I'm right. stepping away and I'm trying to tell you that there is a way to step away. Yeah. You know, and I'm going to do what I need to do. Do you feel that? that silver really believed this was still based in rage. Like we it, fathoms deep comes pretty clear. Like I think we've pretty clearly decided that, that Flint had actually reached kind of a different plane, a different level of integration where it wasn't rage anymore, which doesn't mean it wasn't dangerous. Like it was still dangerous to silver right. and to Flint yeah. and to everyone. Possibly even more yeah. dangerous because it was it reached a, yeah, it yeah. reached a level of purity yeah. that was right. actually that there was no stuff. Yes. The only thing that could stop it was silver, basically. <laughs> yeah. And and I think I, I do think that's I think once again, I don't think the rage was what was a scary he says in he recognized the mm-hmm. rage in himself. And he saw which is when right. he talks okay. about the rage. Yeah. He saw it there. And I think the deflation he had that. He was like, I want to see the world burn. Mm-hmm. And then after it, the moment Maddie was back, it's like, oh, that was gone. Like mm-hmm. I, and, but he got a glimpse. And even if he doesn't still see Flint as completely that, he got a window into it that he wouldn't yeah. have otherwise. Yeah. And I think, but what, what, for me, it wasn't that he thought it was rage at the end, which is why this mm-hmm. needed to be stopped. I was like, the scariest thing for him was that Flint yeah. forgave him. That he was that... Just that he was that stubborn, that he was mm-hmm. that immovable, and whether it's about rage or not, once like, again, yeah, I don't. Think, I think the I think that clarity, <laughs> the Flynn's clarity, of like it's fine, we'll put right. it back together. Like it's like <laughs> that, that was a good Toby <laughs> Stevens. <laughs> You're right. The impressions oh, are good. I, I was only going halfway. <laughs> no, that was good though. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. I saw the he little had little me there um, too. <laughs> <laughs> you had me there too. Yeah. That's not supposed to happen. A lot of time with Toby Stevens. He, he, he possesses me sometimes, even when I when I don't mean to. Not in conversation. Probably not um, terrible. But, no, it's great. No, he's the most fantastic person in the world. It's that. like yeah. I think that's. I think everyone's doing Toby Stevens impersonations all the time. Just to you see, so you have to fill that space. <laughs> it was always a stone's throw away. But mm. um, but yeah, but I think. In, I think that was what was scarier. I, I think, he, and by the end, I think he was really, I don't know. I think once again, he, 
he no longer could see through Flint's eyes the way he did before. See yeah. that ideal of the, the hope that humanity, the hope in humanity, that if you screw it all up and burn it down, that the yeah. basic human decency will build something better on from silver. So he could no longer see the ideal, you know, uh, Flint's ideal and Thomas Hamilton's ideal, and this whole thing that had, that had been there that was driving Flint where, so that was gone, which is where that opaqueness I think came from. But I still think what he saw so clearly was just, this would never stop that idea that mm. once again, that, that I, that old idea of Flint, you know, he'd take a, you know, what, take an oar and walk in till someone mistook yep. it for a shovel. I mean, that died too soon. Well, except for the little reference in Forte. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. That's right. It wasn't his he reference. Was, you know, that's true. He wasn't still hoping for that world. Yeah. And so I think that's where he saw him, I think, very mm-hmm. clearly at the end in just going, mm-hmm. well, there's no, if me sending men to kill you and turning on you so completely cannot shake you from the way you see this happening. Yeah. I don't yeah. think you're seeing right. this clearly anymore. Mm. Mm. <laughs> it oh, it's, it's so awful. Yeah, yeah it's it it's a tragic story. Yeah, it, it, all, it all makes me sad. Yeah. I mean, you know, when I guess I spent a lot of time right after the finale really existing in Flint's point of view. And so oh, that I think yeah. really influenced a lot of my, you know, my my side of the analysis towards Silver. And then uh, I had been kind of easing over the last, whatever, two months towards Silver's point of view. And then John, you know, fully in that superpower that John Steinberg has, he managed to break my oh, yeah. heart and expand my empathy at the same time <laughs> when he was talking mm-hmm. about Silver. It was something that I, I think you guys talked about it a bit, but it was actually one of Lauren Sarnett's mm-hmm. articles where she had a mi- moment of realization about Silver being insecure. And it was interesting for me going, oh, he's so re- like deeply right. insecure through all of, like, all, I mean, all the show, really, but from the moment the leg is gone, mm-hmm. he sees right. himself as less. And I think everything he had before, he's kind of wits in his way of working. He thought, I'm always going to be okay. And whatever he's gone through before, he's gone, I survived this. I'm going to be okay. Nothing can shake me. The leg changed all that to the point where he only saw one life for himself, which was on this mm-hmm. ship with these men. And the kind of, it completely changed who he is because, yeah, he went from someone going, I'll always be okay because I can always look after myself right. to I cannot look after myself. Oh. I'm going to try but his biggest fear, as he said, is like when you say, we'll take care of you. Right. Like that was, right. so he was, so he felt he was always a step away, I think, of having nothing and being no one. Mm. And then, and that's why I think Marty mm-hmm. was so important. Yes. I yep. was just thinking that. I don't know if he ever thought he'd find that, but especially once he lost the leg, he never thought he'd yeah. find that. And especially not someone so I, extraordinary as Marty. Right. I think the whole thing blew his mind. And he didn't quite, which is why having those conversations like the, would mm-hmm. I be enough for you? Right. It became like, first it was, I think before they really knew how they felt about each other, when it was like, okay, she likes me because cool. I'm this young leader. I'm looking right. up. You know, there was, I think most of their conversations were sharing the fact that they were young leaders, both kind of, I think between season three and four, mm-hmm. you know, over their heads. But, you know, and kind of dealing with it, though, and being like, well, this is kind of cool that, you know, Queen and Flint are still making decisions, but they're running stuff and working up and they're getting ready to be the leaders. Mm -hmm. And I think in the beginning of that, it's like, you know, they've got all the romance is blossoming, but it's very much connected to all this. And then there's a shift where it's going like, oh, it's not like the romance isn't happening because of the revolution, everything. I think for him, for him, it's like, no, I think that's more important. I think that started being like, oh, but if I got this, once again, because it's something he never thought he, because he was so insecure, thought he'd never have that, right. thought his life was pretty much over as far as the things he could want once it was gone. I've kind of talked in circles here. No, no, this is fascinating. Okay. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that I think it was so, it, it just shocked him in such a deep way, which is why, even though it maybe wasn't the, the relationship has gone on for so long, yeah. for him, it was everything. Mm. And because mm-hmm. it was, it was her in a lot of ways. And it was also, just a, a part of him, he was kind of finding a part of himself through Marty. Yes. That I don't think he'd ever, I think even before, after the thing, even before the show started, he was so like, I don't, his refusal to connect with anyone mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. of things he'd been through before and knowing what it costs to connect to anyone, 
Mm-hmm. He was, so, you know, and, and whether it was the crew or Flint and this, even when he was like becoming brothers with the crew, it was mm-hmm. a responsibility, but it was also, I think, had a fear of being left behind and being, as he says, a cripple with right. nothing. Right. right. Where Marty, that, the way the human connection hit him with Marty, just with the idea of losing that turned him into, a, I think, completely changed his nature. Mm. Yeah, the moment that we really noted that was um, in episode five, right after Flint had given up and gone with Eleanor, and when they had the conversation about will you be enough, and they were arguing, but then Maddie turned around and said to him, I understand how hard this is for you. And Liz and I talked about that a lot, that that up until then, you know, Silver had always presented himself as a really useful tool to everyone, and everyone was really happy to experience like to use him that way i mean we learn in 409 and we need to talk a lot about 409 that flint sought more than that but that up until that point for the viewer experience was that silver presented himself as useful everyone said awesome you're useful but i don't really give a shit about how this affects you Mm. yeah and that that was the first time that we the viewers saw a a person say to silver you know what I understand you. I care about you. We're disagreeing right now, but but understand that I that I'm taking seriously how this is affecting you as a person. Mm. And that for us was like the moment we were like, okay, yeah, there's just no way that this isn't the primary relationship for Silver from this moment on. Even though it was re- seemed really hard for Silver to lose Flint, yeah, just then in those tunnels. Well, and that kind of thing um, makes yeah. me wish that we had seen more of how. Fl- uh, of how Silver and Maddie got together, um, as, yeah. as beautiful as that hard cut was to to right. the two in bed, and just scene. beautiful and yeah. glowing, and you're like, yes, this happened. All right, I, I would have loved to see those those moments of of the human connection that you talked about that startled and right. surprised him, and that he leaned into, and and how because while it while we all you know were ready for it, I, I would have liked to see a little bit more. I'm sure it was lovely. No, absolutely, because once again, anytime you actually got to see them afterwards, other than that one you know, kind of bedroom scene, mm-hmm. there's serious right. plot going on. Oh, yeah. You know, right. which is all... Right, yeah, yeah. They're, so, like, totally under pressure. <laughs> yeah, and I think, as I said, I think mo- that's how they their relationship blossomed, I think, was talking yeah. strategy and leadership and all those mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. So I think they fall back into that very easily. You know, it's probably like when a couple oh. runs a business together. It's like you can switch it right. off, but when you're in business mode, it's like we know how to do this really well. Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to stop and go, are you okay, Craig? Okay, cool, but let's get this shit done. Mm-hmm. And so... There's a lot of handing of weapons. Handing of weapons, very important <laughs> relationship <laughs> moments. Here, hold yeah. this shotgun, Bay. <laughs> I think that, that was... I don't think... Oh, I could be wrong. Well, I... Yes, well, there was the handing the of the knife. That was when they weren't romantically involved, I assume. But that seemed very crucial. Yeah, I think the handing of the knife was scripted. I don't think the handing of the gun was scripted. Really? I think that was a, like a... Yeah, that she came back and we had that conversation, but I think we tagged that on. You know, re- just rehearsing the scene. Yeah. And when they Good could be ad. A nice, nice. So, Luke, one of one of the things that you told us... It was so, it was so interesting. I love re-listening to our interview with you after season three because I realized actually listening to your interview and actually everyone's listening to you and John and Toby it's amusing how much you all were seemingly talking about seasons one through three but actually you were kind of talking about season four all three of you I can Um, see that makes sense Mm -hmm. because that's where your heads were right Uh, but it was it's it's fun to decode that now now that we've actually seen season season four but um, you said back then that 409, when you were, when you were, we had asked you which is your favorite episode, and you had said either the Becalmed or you hadn't yet seen it, that you said that, that episode nine of season four was your favorite written episode. Um, so I wanted to go into that now. I mean, it's one of my favorite episodes of the whole series. It's incredible. And so, yeah, let's just talk about what you love about it, and then we can get into the backstory question. Oh, yeah. Um, no, look, I just... It was everything I could have wanted to do on the show, I think, by the end. It was mm-hmm. it was so it, – it's great when you do get to a point where it's everything you feel like – everything that needed to happen story-wise, but it's also everything you wanted to see happen as a fan. Like, it just kind of – that them, like, pirates running around an island chasing each other, burying treasure was so – not what sure. the show was before. Like you couldn't have, during season three, you couldn't have thought that we'd get there and earn mm-hmm. it to get there. And then and a training montage of Flint teach. You know, it's something that at the wrong time yes. would have been so naff. 
but when it comes, it's it, I, I just I just love that whole sequence, and I love the evolution. I, I like that it fell in bet- where it did. That you got to go back and find this window between three and four, and see how far they've come. It's kind of so what the, where the story needed to go, but also such like pirate fan fiction in a way that it was. Mm-hmm. It just really was the best of both worlds, and I mean. I, Look, there was it was obviously it was great for me because there was a lot of lot of silver in that, and we really got to see sides of him that we hadn't seen before on both sides. I think we we got to take him to the point that I think everyone hoped you'd get to in a way. Not that you sure. wanted Flint and Silver to turn against against each other, but you would have. I think everyone would have felt cheated if there wasn't a moment where you really saw them go head to head. Then at the same time, you get to see them being closer than they've ever been. I think during season three and four, when they're that gap in between the that we missed where as right. I tried to tell you at the end of season three, they were. Really good <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and once again, I had to further knowledge going forward, but I think it was, I think it's similar to that thing. That, as I remember that it wasn't silver ever threatening, but silver just being aware right. of what Flint of who Flint is yeah. and being the agent of chaos, but realizing that something has changed within himself. So seeing it more as a philosopher than as a, a person going, I'm going to be the end of you, going, I don't think I'm going to – I don't feel right now yeah. in whatever's happening that I'm going, to, I'm going to fall victim the same way that these other people have. Hmm. No, after seeing 409 and the beautiful moment in their relationship, which, you know, is a moment and – it definitely makes 310 have totally different meaning and be tragic in a different way. Like not in a, not in that same way of being of silver being threatening, but actually being more of a foreshadowing of what's going to be difficult for silver Mm. more so than what would end up being difficult for Flint necessarily. Yeah. And I think we all, I think in both getting similar things of what we talked about with the dragon speech and with 409, I think in both sides you see Silver struggling to, in a way, wishing he could be someone else mm-hmm. and maybe someone bigger and maybe someone with more, maybe someone more like Flint or more like these other people around him. But God, being that awful feeling when you know you just aren't or can't do that thing yeah. or can't go to that place within yourself. Yeah. And people have that in life and people have it in yes. relationships all the time when you're going, I wish I could go there. Yes. I wish I could yes. be there with you on this thing. And I'm, it's just not in me. I have to and say maybe- that surprised me about Silver because he was, he did seem to be so, um, so, so Slytherin in so many ways. He did seem to be so <laughs> and so. He's very adaptable. And he but is. He's adaptable because he, but it's because he, I, I think it's maybe that thing because he's never really anywhere. Right. And he this is why I think that his whole thing about how his backstory doesn't affect him and it's behind him, it doesn't matter, is bullshit. Because if his backstory was behind him and it didn't matter, then Maddie oh, wouldn't matter so completely. much. Completely. Yeah. I, I think it's, I, which was interesting because I wrote, we've never talked backstory because for the purposes, like John and I, because the purpose mm-hmm, of the right. show, it doesn't matter. It, it plot why. You know, as he said before, it makes sense. He Silver is the man from nowhere, which is in contrast yeah. to the man who is so his past. Right. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that, but I had something going in that was kind of in my backstory for Silver that seems to, that still tracks for me and tracks through the whole thing. Um, and I, I think that's absolutely true, that whatever is in his backstory has completely made him who he is. Mm-hmm. But it's always true. That is the case of all people. Yeah, exactly. But the difference is Flint is going, I am going to look at everything future based on the past mm-hmm. and I'm going to weigh them up again because of this, this. And Silver's doing the opposite. Silver's doing, because I'm not paying attention to that, because I don't want to commit to this, it probably means he's also not going to commit to anything else because I'm not right. going to commit to that these things in my past are actually me. I'm distancing sure. myself from them. It makes it easy for him to distance himself from everything else to go halfway there and go like, Hey, I can be this. I can be that. Cause he doesn't stand in any particular spot within himself. He hasn't defined himself in the context of anything, either to himself or to the world around him or to anyone that he comes in contact with. Mm. So where do you see his relationship 
I mean, it's it is so interesting because I mean, I I understand perfectly the kind of thematic choices that the writers made. Like that's brilliant to have the person you know to have someone like Flint taken down by nobody and that the backstory. But you you've listened to us, so you know kind of where we've gone with it of that silver. That because every other character, to some extent, has come to terms on some level with their backstory, but Silver obviously has not because he refuses to. Um, how much do you yeah. feel like Silver is limited by that as as a you know as a person? Like how much do you think that his inability to to come to terms with his backstory gives the backstory power over him in ways that he can't control? Or do you yeah, just reject that idea is... altogether? No, no, I think it's completely right. I think he is, I, I think it's kind of what I was saying is that he's, it, it's easy for him to be disconnected to things, to say, mm-hmm. even from the season one, like, yeah, guilt is bad, but it goes away. Right. You know, and like, yep. in, and to go like, yeah, I'll be your, I'll step in and play this role. Oh, you want me to go talk to these men telling this shit? Great, fine. I, I, I know what to, I know what I'm doing. I can go right. do that because I'm not connected to anything. I don't have a moral, he doesn't have a moral compass within himself. You know, I think he, he still doesn't do terrible things just for the sake of it. He doesn't have that in him, but he also. No, obviously not. He's a good person on many levels. I, yeah, but I think by as well, because he's not going, he's not looking at a bigger right or wrong. That doesn't right. exist for him. He can right now go like, hmm. I think this right now, this is the right choice that seems because also, you, and that was the thing, you know, we're talking about, yeah, that's, you know, guilt is bad with Max in season one going, but she made this choice and you have to just mm-hmm. go, you don't look at the overall thing here. She made this choice. It sucks, but there she is. And you now have a choice to do this. And I think, and look at it in the moment about you. Don't try and become part of some narrative. Don't mm-hmm. think about how people are going to write about you or what the people on the street are going to say. Just like, is in the moment way of thinking of things, and I think that's he always, how he always run it for himself. And but what that means is when you're not connected to anything overall, you're kind of adrift in the middle, mm-hmm. and is probably the reason why he, why there was still some of that disconnect with Marty at the end as well, because she was so, she had a reason to be angry. Yes, she, she did. had a reason to fight for something. She had a she had a narrative. There was a story she wanted to tell, a story she wanted told, mm-hmm. that she wanted to be part of, that she wanted to put into being. And that's just not in him because he's, you know, yeah. but he's so disconnected from that because he doesn't know where he stands within this, within his right. story or the story around him. Right. Um, and that's, I think it was always where he kind of sat, and which is interesting to play a character like that. You have all these people who are very much, they have a code or they have a, a place they come from and, Silver was just this guy who could go, I'll be this person now, I'll be that right. person now, I'll be a new, a new archetype, a new character, because what do I care? Right. right. See, and this is where um, John said the thing, and I'm going to quote him, that really haunted me about Silver. Um, so he said in our interview uh, two weeks ago that his trauma, because we had we had brought up this beautiful dichotomy that we had been kind of dancing around, but Alistair really put into two words for us, the idea of someone's mm-hmm. uh, trauma of their backstory versus their legend. And so yep. he's, John yeah. said that, that Silver's trauma is that he was removed from his own story and that his curse is that he is stuck in someone else's story that he never wanted to be in and couldn't get out of. And I just made that connection recently to the idea of Rackham, that Anne Bonnie says that he's always trying to stand by giants. And then it made me realize that essentially Silver's, the two most important people in Silver's life, and the type of person obviously that he's attracted to are giants. That he's, the two yeah. most important people in his life are Flint and Madi who are giants. So in a way, Silver, in a less flashy or less obvious way, has also always wanted to stand by giants. And part of his story is just how dangerous that is. If you're not, that if you just want to stand by giants, you're kind of stuck with being with the story those giants want to tell. Yeah, I think, and also that he can stand by them because he is such a useful tool, Mm -hmm. I think is the curse as well. Absolutely. He's so smart. Mm Mm-hmm. He'd chosen when when his past happened to him and he'd chosen to turn into a flint in that moment or the moment he he did. 
Like if, if there had been a whole season after he thought Maddie was dead and him and Flint take things mm-hmm. over, he that could have been a whole, you know, he could have been a month. He could have been a giant at that time. Yep. I'm going to actually, I'm going to now use, I'm going to tell a story to myself that my love was taken from me and now I can lash out at the world. But I think mm. he's too rational. Yeah. I, I don't think he can, I think he sees both sides of everything. Mm-hmm. And so I think that could almost be the difference with them. And probably, and it's either how he chose to deal with his trauma, that his trauma was different, that he sees both sides of it. That I don't think yeah. he ever really thought, like, we're not doing some terrible shit here. Right. Yeah. You know, where Flint can always see it right through. It's like, yeah, but right. this is you. And there's also this and there's, and there's all these other people that, for them, you're a horrific, well, as he, as he said in season two, it was like, no, they can see you as the villain here. Of course they can. I know right. you see this side, but for them, like, they don't understand what, this doesn't make any bloody sense to them. But, yeah, so I think that's probably – that's maybe the thing, that he's smart enough and adaptable enough and charming enough to kind mm-hmm. of – to be in the same position as those giants. But he's – I think his ego is different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That he kind of doesn't see him I – mean, I think that's a big thing. He just doesn't see himself as being so important. He Look, she was brought up to be a leader. Sure. Flint also had – you know, he has the whole <laughs> – Flint and his ego was a whole other relationship that, yeah, you can right. do a whole podcast. About. <laughs> yeah, that's a different we were t- we keep talking about like different ways to watch the show and like watching Flint and his ego as a relationship is definitely a way you can watch that show. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but Silver, I don't think he could ever see himself as mm-hmm. a giant. So I don't know how he'd right. ever fill yeah. that role. And once again, the legend be him. Other people could talk about it. No, and that makes sense because Silver seems so uncomfortable all of season four. Like this this legend has been imposed on Silver. Which is actually surprising because he seems, I mean, he, because he is so ambitious and because he uses everything and he takes advantage of everything that's thrown his way. But he does seem uncomfortable with with this much gravitas thrown upon his person. It seems to me like Silver's good at being a wingman, but once he was put forward and didn't have Flint there standing yeah. next to him, he's just like, oh shit, I didn't really want this actually. <laughs> he played, uh, there's a great phrase, um, I think we talked about it in, dr- in drama school and a friend of mine brings up, which is like playing happy mm-hmm. lower status. And mm-hmm. that's like, that's how he got right. his power was by being a dick and having everyone hey, punch yo. him in the face. <laughs> like mm. he was knowing Randall's yeah. power. Yeah. But because, like, no one understands how important he is. And that was where he was great at lying. And in Treasure right. Island, he's the same. It's why he character that he puts on himself in Treasure Island is, okay. I'm just the cook. And he's like, oh, Jim, yeah. lad, we're here. And he's like, aye, aye, captain. And all the other pirates, when they're getting to Treasure Island, are ready to mutiny. He's like, no. Like, play. Don't. If you, if you show them now. Mm-hmm. That you like, you like fight them now. You fucked it all. Go over, yeah. play the dumbass till they've found the treasure, put it back on the ship. Then you turn around and throw them off. But it's this ego of other people who want to prove that we're stronger, that we're more important. And Silver's like, mm-hmm. no, no, no. He doesn't. Silver's never really cared what people think about him. Yeah, which mm-hmm. was his great strength. Because it's like I don't care what you think about me. I'll I'll be a dick. I'll be you know like I'll be right. I'll be a, a coward. Clown. Yeah, a, a coward. coward. Uh huh. That's I don't think that it's like what you said at the beginning. He's not a coward. But he's like yeah. I'll say I'm a coward. Say I don't care what you. Yeah, I'm a coward. Whatever. I'm gonna I'm right. gonna live. Like mm-hmm. that's all yeah. about. Hmm. And so being put in this position where he's now the face and has to put up a front of like I'm the I'm the right. pirate king. Yeah, is like he so knows right. he's not. Yeah. That it's it's an yeah it was always funny to, fun to play that because you know you're like well yeah. I've got to look really tough here and you're also going like but also Silver's acutely aware that he's a one legged guy who was never meant to be a pirate well and then you get to have Israel hand slap you around a little bit so you know there's that <laughs> which was pretty cool yeah but but talk to me Luke about um about coming across the cook mm-hmm. in the bottom of the ship there in four ten. That that's was the ten, best. And not nine, that's right? Ten. No, that's in ten. Yeah, that's tell me, there. tell me about that because we had yeah. our opinions on it, of course, but there's only so much that we can speak into that. So tell us about yours, please. Uh I, th- I mean, it was just, I don't even know how much I overthought that. Be- I just thought when I read it, I'm like, that's the best to be given that, to get that reflection of the first episode. Like, you know, uh-huh. what was. 
the first, you know, mm-hmm. the most important scene, the mm-hmm. beginning, the intro mm-hmm. there. And I remember even like when we'd go to Comic Con the first, the New York Comic Con the first year, and they just show a clip, and it was just that opening. So I was the only character that kind of so that, and which was all that scene, you know. And so it's just great when you get that moment. It not only for the show and the character you reflect on, you're also staring down at a great actor who's coming in and really happy to be there and being like, oh, I'm playing the cook right. for one scene. Sure, and, sure, and yeah. We're, and oh, my same. God, I didn't even think about that, Liz. That's brilliant, yes. Complaining about my back. Holy fuck, my, uh-huh. Because yeah, I'm like, oh, yeah. So it's it like as much as that moment's happening for the characters, for all us <laughs> actors, once again, you've got a oh guy. Oh, my God. Fun, Luke. And I'm going, oh, nice to meet you. Yeah, how are you doing? Oh, this is, <laughs> and we're like, we've done four years of pain and we're there covered it. Yeah. So it was... That's brilliant. With me as well. Yeah. Yes. No, that's... that's wonderful. God, I would never have thought about yeah, it in yeah. those terms. That's so wonderful. Yeah, but and sure, once again, and that's my experience. Right. There's only sure, those sure. times on the day, you know, and then of you watch. Of course. Yeah. One of the, my, I, it was one of the I things that, because you shoot everything oh so out of order. Uh huh. I think we'd shot all the stuff. Maybe already we'd done the, in the forest, dragon stuff. Oh my God, you did all of that already. Okay. So I had to be. So, yeah, so I think that it happened. It's just one of the things where you track back when you go, oh, in that scene, it would be great to be a bit more like, it ended up being right. a silhouette anyway, but I remember shooting and going, oh, you want to be covered in right. blood. And oh, you want to be yeah, sure, sure, yeah. But then you're like, oh, no, hang on. I wouldn't clean up before going here right. and this happening and this and this. So you're like, oh, no, we can't do it. Um, which is just always, <laughs> they're just those continuity things. Silver had just like pretty dramatically just killed a guy and like shown all of his sword sword skills right before that. But um, but yeah, it was so it was bad. I think it was a I I didn't have to think about how much Silver thought about the reflection because just you do it and you're like, shit, that's <laughs> a lot's happened in the period of time since uh, since <laughs> I was that guy. Wow. See now, and we uh, well, no, this is me, right? This is just me. I'm like the sole voice of this. Like everyone's like, oh, it's this crazy thing because he sees himself, and I'm like, no, but actually he doesn't because that guy's like cowering and kind of crying. And Silver in episode one, right? Yeah, no, Silver never was. Silver never was. Right, Silver in episode one, it was like almost. It's like, I mean, it's it's a thing that I always bring up with Black Sails is that you see these things that seem like parallels, but then they actually for me always point out the difference Aren't quite, and so it's like yeah. silver yeah. wasn't that guy silver was like he had just maybe killed the real cook we can't tell but he was already like plotting with the he had yeah. already found the schedule and he was plotting with the schedule and he had all these plans in his mind he was about to do a big con and he was still a little clean-faced guy in a blue jacket though i agree with you that they were not in their sense the same that silver was never actually that guy yeah, silver yeah. always was more savvy than that person yeah well i think as well so but I think it's Silver on that journey. Like, he didn't want to die. He'd be like, no, I think he didn't want pain. Was one of the big things. Like, I think if you go like, but he also, I don't think he had anything to live for in any way as well, which is probably, you're, you're right. When you talk about the contrast, like this guy, you go like, okay, this guy is attached to his life, but who, you know, and whatever mm-hmm, it is. And yeah, I think mm-hmm. Silver, he's actually from the moment cowering. we met him. Yeah. He's, and in kind of like as most humans would, Right. But there was always the, you're right. The contrast with the silver was always kind of seeing somewhere above. That yeah. I think he disconnected himself from something in his own life, mm-hmm. and so he was always able to go like, okay, yeah, to separate himself in a way and, mm-hmm. and not be afraid in the same way. He was like, no, don't hurt me because that sucks. <laughs> don't but, cut my leg off, please. I was just trying to be nice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> No, but it was interesting because when he says to that guy, are you a fucking coward? Like that guy was actually, I guess, arguably being a coward versus, yes. and I, it was you actually really brought this up for us. The idea that Silver kept saying, I am a coward, but he was kind of like all through season one, actually doing pretty brave stuff when he needed to, mm-hmm. to yeah. get by, including but that like first being, moment. Yeah. But being happy, lower status. Yeah. Happy, lower status. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. like that. And that's when you go, like, it's funny to think about it. I'm like, should I have been more afraid? But it's like, no, but it's like, no, no, no. No, no it, it's perfect. I'm just saying that's, that's always the actor's thing. If you go back, like, could I have done this? Could I have done that? Right. Blah, blah. But no, right. it was exactly who he was. And he yes. was always right. yes. ahead of everyone else. He was a con no, man. He was like, oh, wait, yeah. you said you're a cook and they always need cooks. Then I'm going to now pretend to be afraid and say I'm an excellent cook because that's going to get me on this crew. Yeah. This is what yeah. I need to do. Yeah. And that was sil- season one. Silver was not the guy who's like, "Holy shit, I'm so afraid I'm about to die." There's a scary pirate coming. 
he was the guy who was like, huh, mm-hmm. okay, let me figure out the angle. Let me figure out how to survive. Only which is a different became person. afraid when he attached himself to something, which is when exactly. he lost the leg. You know, is that, exactly. and where well, I think he's terrified. But he only got there by putting other people before him. Yep. You know, and I think which is the, yeah, it's exactly that. But when we meet him, he's putting no one before. He's like, oh, yeah, like, and he mm-hmm. knows, if you, it's like that, it's almost like the invention of lying, which I haven't really seen, but like, I know the premise of that Ricky Gervais film. Oh, yeah. It's like, oh, if you're willing to do so, no one else is doing this thing. But if you're willing to live in a way that other people won't and don't expect, you can, you can kind of skirt around everything. Because most people expect a certain level of decency and humanity. If you want to be a bit of a psychopath, you can kind of, as we see evidence in every area of the world, you can get a lot yep. of shit done yep. if you don't worry about yep. being a good human being. Uh, yep. No, and yeah. that's the beautiful thing about Silver is you basically, I feel like Silver's story is you watch Silver um, go through a process of more and more con- connectiveness mm-hmm. and each yeah. time he connects to other human beings it's almost like his worst fears it's like yeah. he was clearly had this horrible trauma from his earlier life that the only word yeah. we have for is horror and then he's like i i don't need people that's good yeah. i'm all good and then he starts to need people and the more connected he becomes so it's like first the crew and then flint and then mm-hmm. maddie and so as he gets deeper and deeper and it's in a way, it's almost like the tether he needed was tether, from connectedness. Yes. Uh-huh. Yep, I was gonna go yep. there. <laughs> that was that was always gonna happen. So it's like the more the more connected he becomes, the larger the consequences are for him until he has to make the hardest choice of his life at the very end. I feel like that's that's my that's my that's my short version of Silver's story. Absolutely, and I I think I heard in one of the talks this this awful feeling like oh. He hasn't changed that much. That was me. I take it back. <laughs> this is me thinking it now. No, but this is even as we talk this through now, realizing that like, mm-hmm. okay, because he made a self, he was very selfish at the beginning and he made a selfish choice at the end. Mm-hmm. But I think the difference is because he was making selfish choices at the beginning to keep himself distant from people and to probably sure. not hurt right. them and to keep himself, do you, we're fine. I'm not responsible for anyone. And it was a choice to be selfish. Oh, can I defend my my opinion there? Actually, that wasn't actually what I was saying about him. That's interesting. Oh, okay. What I was saying that hadn't what I was saying about Silver back then was that not that he was selfish, was that actually the thing the thing that most motivated him was a need for connection with people. Yeah. And that early Silver was him protesting right. too much that he didn't need people because he really did. And then we watch him go down the yeah. road of actually giving in to his need for people, and that's what takes him to dangerous places. No. Absolutely. I know you said that. I think it was, it might have been Lauren or it was someone else, or it was just some other realization oh. going, or someone else at some point brought up, oh, he made, he was selfish at the beginning and that his choice at the end was very selfish. And, but I think mm, the right. difference was at the beginning, selfish. And he was saying he was being selfish sure. by keeping a distance. Mm-hmm. And I think at the end, in some ways, he was beyond choice. That there was, that mm-hmm. because of his connection, you, you do realize you just totally used black sales language. Beyond, Beyond choice, choice is totally is. a black sales yeah. language thing. Yeah. <laughs> I do know. Yeah, it is that thing that he got to that point where it mm-hmm. was, it was like where he was with Marty at the end was. Mm-hmm. It wasn't him tactfully doing this or deciding to do anything. Right. It was the only it thing. Was he could everything do. in his being saying, mm-hmm. "I want her. I want her safe. Whatever is in my control, I will use to make that happen." And no, that totally works. Yeah, which is, even though, once again, it's not a, it's by no means a selfless act, any of the things right. he does at the end or does or doesn't do. Right. But it still couldn't be further from the guy he was at the beginning, who was sure not, sure. He, he was never behold, like all of his decisions were very much kind of like, you know, intelligence crafty because he wasn't right. connected to anything. Yeah. Right. And I, I love actually that you use beyond choice because beyond choice in the worldview of black sales always has been connected to things that are basically the essence of the yeah, person. Mm-hmm. Right. 
and yeah. and something that that is outside of their realm of choice, like something that just yeah. they have to do. I mean, it's interesting. Max was the one who used the word and she actually did go beyond her thing that she thought was beyond choice. But, but yeah, you know, Max is kind of superhuman. I love the idea that that was Silver's beyond choice thing. Yeah. And then like she evolved out of that, Silver's journey, this is not the end of his story. The curse of Silver at this moment right. is that his story will, it's still got to happen. It's still continuing afterwards. Yeah. So he, you couldn't have Silver being a fully realized being who understands himself right now because then he's not this awful, tragic villain that we love but hate because he's still so... Like One of the joys of Treasure Island is Jason with him, that he is still these two things. That he, you're like, he's really, you know, we, you want to impress him and you want him to like you, but then he will turn on you and still be this other thing. And so this beyond choice moment is him giving in to this thing. And it's all his better intentions and his thoughts are intelligent. He gives in to, it is driving me. It doesn't, but it doesn't make sense with any other things we've talked about or done or things I've committed to, but I have to follow this mm-hmm. through now. Right. Right. No, that's that's beautiful. And um, yeah, that actually goes with um, what Andrew Dice said about Silver, which is that Silver on some level can't tell his backstory because this is essentially his backstory that you can't tell your story until until it's done. Oh, and yeah. And it's almost like we've it's almost like the end of Black Sails is kind of midway between the seminal part of Silver's story. And yeah, we, it, it has to continue from there into into Treasure Island before it becomes truly a story in the way that Flint's mm-hmm. story is already a story. And that's one of the tough things when you're, what, what, once again, to stick the landing like they did when you're not only beholden to Treasure Island out there and you can mm-hmm. bend a few things, but you know that that's coming up, but also history as well. Like it, mm-hmm. right. it, yeah. it had to fail. Right. Of course. Because otherwise we'd have the American Revolution in the early 1700s. <laughs> yeah. Exa- and, and the Maroon Wars as well. Like that yep, treaty absolutely. was signed. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. and so if uh, you let the Maroon Wars from there take not, off the let's way not, it Let's not go down that treaty <laughs> yeah, road. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, and this, but that once again, but we can, it's yeah. just the thing for Silver, a lot fell on his shoulders in the last episode of Half Yeah, You absolutely. got like, there's a lot of things you could want him to do, but for reasons that I think ended up being great for the still having all the meat and the juice in that character and wrestling with his choices. It's still also, he bore a lot of the brunt of going like, okay, he's got Treasure Island on one shoulder and history on the other and had to make a choice that worlds live beyond the last episode as well. Okay, so Luke, this reminded me of another question I had. I was just, uh, I actually this week watched uh, the series finale again with my cousin, who was a first time watcher. Mm -hmm. And um, I was struck by something I hadn't thought about before. So in that last scene, with oh not the last scene in the scene where silver and maddie are talking about and silver tells the story about flint mm-hmm. uh you know it's see it was a good story you know however you see the ending it was a true story or not mm-hmm. a true story or variations of true but the part that was fascinating was that silver told this really great story and then maddie the thing that maddie was mad about was the idea that silver had been plotting against her war for so long so and it felt to me like silver was a bit surprised like maddie said okay so you were you were planning to betray me all this time that you had sent tom morgan so long ago and you were planning to betray me all this time do you feel like silver was surprised by that part like that he had expected to tell her a good story and then she was mad about a thing that maybe he didn't expect her to be mad about like that was my sense, but I'm curious how you see that scene. So there, are, yeah, there are two ways to look at that moment, depending on how you see the ending. But there is some overlap because I think Silver hasn't been doing this for very long, like having a girlfriend, fiance, future wife. You know, where right? Yeah. This, that also as well. I think in his him maybe this him starting to see the idea that they would break away. I, I think it would have been too much for him at that time to have gone to Maddie. Well, I think the most he could have was said, hey, if we had to walk away from this, would I be enough? Mm-hmm. You know, that moment of going like, which is, which is kind of around the kind of time where he would have had to send Morgan off. 
Um, thinking about that and inquiring, I think maybe in his head he wasn't doing anything wrong yet. He wasn't betraying anything. For her, mm. who is so hard right. and fast to this goal, absolutely. The idea that you were starting to see a potential way out is a betrayal everything right. she was after. For him, it was... I think at the time he's been in NASA, which is not that long when you scan it back and everything they've gone through, everything's switched sides and gone back and forth so many times. I think, once again, he's he's kind of too rational to be the great leader, potentially. Mm-hmm. But he can see too many signs. That him thinking, him hearing the story from Max about this place, maybe thinking that Thomas Hamilton could be there and sending someone off to check is was... Already, yes, it shows that he's waving in his commitment to going, hey, we either burn down the world or nothing. Okay. You know, but that's that's really what that moment is. And I think it probably did shock him to hear that, to go at that moment go, like, that's what you're worried about? That I was – and it makes sense. The other side is that if he has been telling a story, he got caught out on part of his lie. That none of this had happened. Right. He never sent anybody anywhere. And and there's that moment. I, I mean, I personally, I don't, because my mind can bounce between all the different endings as well. So I don't have a particular one that, that I settle in. And I think it's a little bit oh, of both. I think, uh-huh. but I think mostly in that in that moment, it is. I think in that whole last speech sort of believes that he's doing the right thing because at that point, for the first time, he used to be very rational and would see all sides to everything. And he be- he became someone in those last few episodes who only had one thing. When he's chasing mm-hmm. Flint down that island, there is a mm-hmm. compass in his heart that points in one direction, which is to saving Marty and getting her back the mm-hmm. only way he can see. And he'd never been that person before. So I think when he's coming to Marty at the end with his story and I did all this, it's against the wishes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But he was past the point of having any choice in that matter. Right. Well, and also I realized afterwards, like Liz and I were very upset because we had seen Maddie's interactions with Woods Rogers, but Silver hadn't. I mean, we would assume that Silver understood, unlike Woods Rogers, Silver actually understood who his partner Mm -hmm. was. Um, but, But those were actually interactions where she was so firm about not giving in to that treaty. Those are interactions that we're privy to, but but Silver's not actually privy to. No, and I think even Silver's mind at that point, he does. He has come to the, the point where he sees Flint as, he said at the end of season three that you destroyed the people closest to you. That had almost become a fact within Silver yeah. at that point. And then he wants to fight for Marty's cause, but she becomes so alive with Flint, and Flint's become even more this agent of chaos. Mm-hmm. That as much, and he knows Flint better than Marty ever will. He's seeing Marty become a disciple of Flint within this war, ready to follow everywhere. And she's much smarter than him and knows more than him in a lot of ways, but she does not know Flint like he knows Flint. And I think for him, the choice to say, and I was again, not defending it, but I think for him, the, the moment of going, no, I'm taking that away as an option. And I'm to, because mm. I don't, I don't see how we come. I don't see how you come out of this alive. And you might be willing to risk your life, but I cannot. Not even the choice if I can weigh up the pros and cons of this and that and go. I understand your side. I just cannot. That cannot be a possibility for me. I cannot not do everything mm. in my power to stop that from happening. Mm-hmm. And. It's probably not, it's not the most enlightened, most, uh, you know, it was the way, yeah, I think as you do, you talk about the way to love people and there, but for him, I don't think he has a choice at that point. He's a man compelled to do everything he can away from her. Mm. And Flint is the embodiment of danger. Yeah, he certainly is. My last question for you is actually a question that uh, that I received from our dear friend and your dear friend, Lauren Sarner. My, my drinking buddy for the final episode. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to know uh, from Lauren's suggestion, how do you see Treasure Island Silver ending up with a parrot named Flint, considering the story of Black Sails? It, it was interesting because Lauren did bring it up to me as, a, as kind of not maybe believing that this silver that we saw 
you know, would ever get to that point of seeing mm-hmm. a kind of comical way of turning Brian. But I actually think, I mean, everyone needs, you see people do it all the time. They do think people out of rehab and things like that, where you have to create a new narrative about people in it so that you can go, yeah. okay, I'm going to, to move forward. But I also think that wherever he left him, there was, uh, I mean, there's always going to be a sentimentality there. There's going to be some guilt. There's going to be a constant reasoning with himself about did he do the right thing. Mm-hmm. But and because they were, there was a point where they were closer than any two than they'd ever been to anyone else. So I do like the idea that if he came across a parrot that hated him, <laughs> that hated him. <laughs> yeah, just like I think that would be that would be where it would be funny for him. Yeah, that if his parrot whatever that just hates him. And when he's huh. working as a court and he feeds it and he kind of, and eventually when it turns around and it starts coming to him for food, he got like, oh, Flint. <laughs> <laughs> this point oh where God. Yeah. The, if he see it in a creature that could not have, could not have had more disdain for him eventually yeah. comes to rely on him. That that's course. where he got like, you remind me of my old friend. Oh, um, that's beautiful. so. That's the kind of way I reason the uh, yeah, how maybe so it's not just calling a parrot flint in a kind of derogatory way or to right. take the piss, but in a way that he saw something in this animal that reminded him of his friendship with uh, oh, with Jane. I love that. That's so good. I like that I so much that better than, than, yeah, just trying to make a big man small. I like that. Yeah, no, I don't. I mean, I never thought of that when I, I always. I always, even in the book, the joke to me rang of something more profound. Yeah. You know, and because mm-hmm. and, I think it's always, I think Silver always seems proud of being Flint's quartermaster. Yeah. You know, he's not. Right. And he's Absolutely. trying, there are moments in the book where he's trying to be captain, you know, like he's trying to now stand up. He's really, and it's not actually to be captain. I think it's more just trying to get them to bloody listen to him because he knows right. he's the only smart man. But whenever he talks of, he, like he says, you know, and he's he's proud that Flint was proud of him. Mm-hmm. You know, there's these yeah, elements that yeah. but I couldn't get a sense of relationship. So I never got a sense of the... I always thought calling the parrot Flint was something affectionate rather than something derogatory. Mm, I like that very um, much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I do too. Yes. Um. Yeah. So there we go. That's my idea anyway. If we come back in 10 years and do our version of Treasure Island, uh, <laughs> I'm sure John will have a better idea. <laughs> well, he is a brilliant man. Yes. If that ever happens, we will be thrilled and we will podcast we will. about it. Yeah. In the meantime, we are looking forward to everything that you yes. do in the future Keep us with hopes posted. that we could podcast yeah. about those things. I definitely will. Uh, thank you mm-hmm. so much, ladies, again, for the support for mm-hmm. Black Sales. It has mm-hmm. been, uh, it's so nice to do, like, once again, it's all over. So this is a great way to kind of dip back into the Black Sales family, which you are yeah. absolutely a part of. Thank you. Thank you. It's been our honor and our pleasure. Yes. Cheers. So darling. cheers. Yes. Thank you, Luke. And good night, our dear cheers. boys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Take care, sweetie. Cheers. Ready to guns. Full compliment. Luke, I have one last request for you. Okay. Liz and I, uh, you may be aware, have had this game where people do thesis statements and we reward them with pirate names and ship names. And sometimes we forget people even if we adore those people and the last person who needs a ship name is our dear friend katie bonner oh katie bonner oh yes she needs a good one no pressure but who we love very much and she's a huge fan of yours Mm -hmm. and so she needs a ship name would you mind naming her last ship because this is the last time we'll be playing this game okay i'm almost there i'm thinking Mm mm-hmm how about the marrow? The marrow, like bone marrow. The marrow. Oh, yeah. that's good. All right, Katie, there you go. You got a ship named by Luke Arnold. Cheers to Cheers you, Katie. Cheers to you, Katie. Cheers to you. Cheers, Katie. Cheers to you.
Deep is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and access to other programs, please visit us at commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as a dollar a month can be made to patreon.com slash commonroomradio. Join the conversation by using the hashtag FathomsDeep and follow us on Twitter at BlackSalesCast. We ask that you keep your tweets respectful and positive and please avoid spoilers. If you have more to say, we want to hear it in all its spoiler glory. Email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com with Fathoms Deep in the subject line. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.